So good. It's okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming back to the uh, the table um, after the lunch. Did you have a good good lunch? Did you go somewhere? I just had uh, two cookies uh, and three and a half coffees. <laughs> okay. So um, so can we uh, invite the uh, other panelists here? Uh, the uh, um, here is the bowl um, from the. The whole pain, anyway. So, uh, but you were born, sorry, sorry. About that. <laughs> sorry, about that. sorry about that. The other guy is a steward from Quelpy. Please give me a big round of applause, thank you. Hi, and that's me again. Yeah. We met each other last night, right? Coincidentally, at the. Um, some party or something like that, is it? We did, it wasn't coincidental at all. You were hosting a big party on there, right? We did, we had a, a, a fantastic evening and uh, it was good, good to be here today. Yeah, thank you very much. So, the last lead, uh, uh, sorry, Madhu from BNB, Oliva. Yeah. Up your hands, thank you. So, so, um, we have uh, 40 minutes for this panel. So, let me start off the, uh, the session with uh, self-introduction. So, um, would you please uh, make a self-introduction about what you do or what your business is uh, doing or kind of things. And, uh, and also, the, this ti this, the title of this panel is actually, it's a globalizing fintech. But actually, the definition of fintech is totally um, different. Uh, to somebody person maybe. So, uh, if you want to say something about that kind of thing, actually, please add on that. So, let me start off with uh, Stuart. Go ahead. So, uh, to introduce myself, I think that's uh, what you want me to do. Yeah, so Stuart uh, Thornton. Um, I work for a company called WorldPay. Um, my role in WorldPay is to run all of the commercial activities across um, the Asia Pacific region. So, that's everything from Pakistan to Japan to New Zealand and everything uh, in between. Uh, WorldPay, I don't know how many of you have sort of uh, have, have heard of the business. Um, our core focus is uh, payments, global payments. Um, and in Asia Pacific, our focus from a merchant perspective tends to be in the e-commerce um, and digital um, space. Um, and I think uh, you know, perhaps sort of some of the biggest news that we've had in at least the last sort of 12, 24 months uh, the company um, went to IPO in 2015. Um, I think it was one of the largest uh, private equity uh, exits and one of the largest sort of fintech uh, exits um, as well. So it's a great, great company to be part of, and uh, perhaps even better to be in this part of the world as well. Maybe we'll come to that. So, um, in my understanding, BNP Polybar is uh, it's originally from France, maybe, right? Right. So I'm not from BNP, <laughs> but, right? <laughs> the, the, the gentleman to your uh, Oh, sorry, the yeah, paragraph is US. Sorry, sorry, that's sure is um sorry that, sorry that. So while well, used to be a part of the LRBS, it's a Royal Bank of Scotland, right? Is it? That's right, yeah. Sorry so that. um <laughs> it, it, uh, well, pay was part of Royal Bank of Scotland um to about two thousand and ten. Mm. Um I think uh, RBS went through some you know very well publicized challenges um in the in uh, in the UK. Uh, two private equity companies came along and sort of uh, decided that the assets were quite interesting. Um they spent about a billion pounds each uh, on uh, buying the assets and, and relaunched the, the business as, you know, as well pay as we know it today. And uh, I think uh, our chairman used to like to sort of say it was one of the world's largest startups, but I think we kind of cheated a little bit by virtue that we had sort of uh, 150, 200,000 customers because you don't really start that in a, in a startup. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, next, Balloon um, from the um, Hollow Pay, maybe, right? Sorry, <laughs> I'll thank you, sir. So, um, so um, your company, uh, listen for the uh, entrepreneurship, acquired by entrepreneurship, right? Is it, so, so would you like to make yourself the, uh, make yourself an introduction about yourself and then direct some words about, uh, listen to new stuff or something like that? Hi guys, I'm Bar. Uh, I head uh, fitting for Ernst Union for ASEAN. Prior to that, uh, I was heading operations for a company for, called HelloPay, which was acquired by Alipay and is now rebranded as Alipay Southeast Asia. So we went through the real full journey of globalizing FinTech, of building a business across ASEAN, working with 
the largest fintech startup, as they would call it, <laughs> and being acquired by them and being integrated into them, and uh, went through the whole life cycle of setting it up from scratch and to the point of merging it into a very large group. Uh, and now I work with startups and large uh, FIs to help them focus on different challenges and opportunities in the fintech domain, how to, so how to solve those problems, how to bring those right solutions on the table uh, to actually achieve globally sustainable and commercially viable solutions. So that's what I do now. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, actually I didn't recognize that, but actually your title is uh, it's an, the kind of on behalf of the Singapore Fintech Association of Family Fund, right? So that's, that's my night job. Oh. <laughs> so Singapore Fintech Association is uh, the only non-profit trade association mm -hmm. recognized by Singapore government. So it's a non-profit group which is also very uh, working very closely with Unbound to Host and you can see our logo up on the uh, screen as well, the red mm -hmm. logo. Uh, so the objective of that trade association is to help inter uh, manage the interests of the Fintech uh, companies, take them to the government, take them to the regulators, uh, work with the large FIs to manage the challenges of it and the three main uh, objectives inside it uh, achieving access to talent, access to capital and access to market mm -hmm. for Singapore FinTech ecosystem. So which of the uh, corporate, I don't know, which of the enterprise side and the startup side you are standing on actually? Um, I don't need to pick up size man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be having breakfast with one, lunch with uh, second, dinner with third, and supper with fourth. So, uh, uh, so you're happy to connect the people together uh, from the enterprise side and the uh, startup side, vice versa, sort of kind of. Still a human, not a coin yet. I don't need two sides. <laughs> I can have more of them. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. So, Leslie, um, sorry, um, I got a problem that, sorry. I can see your name on the screen, sorry. That, um, Madhu, Madhu from EMP Paliba. So, yes. so that. So, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So, uh, happy to be here, uh, Madhu Dyer. I look after uh, business line within BNP Paribas, which is uh, investment analytics. Uh, so, what we do is we work with institutional investors uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So, pension funds, sovereign funds, uh, large asset managers, uh, insurance companies, and really the role that I play and our team plays. Uh, is one really of uh, providing a rigorous investment analysis on their investment strategies, uh, you know, where they're allocating their assets to, uh, the relationship with their asset managers, how capital is being deployed, uh, and so forth. Um, so I'm part of a very large uh, bank, obviously. Uh, we're about 185,000 people globally. Uh, so I'm part of what's called the corporate institutional banking side of the business. Um, FinTech, and I guess where we come into the picture here and why we're uh, playing a large role, is that uh, a couple of years ago that uh, Paribas, we set up uh, an innovation lab. And the lab was really around harnessing fintech, emerging technologies, and indeed uh, different practices from different parts of uh, the, uh, the landscape. So uh, from consumer discretionary, from transport, from logistics, uh, and how could we enhance what we do for our clients uh, in terms of uh, uh, innovation, in terms of operational efficiency, uh, search for new markets, uh, search for uh, new revenues, new investment streams. Um, so we've really seen technology, we've seen FinTech as an enabler. Uh, we see ourselves effectively uh, the folks that are able to connect the dots for our clients across the value chain. Um, and so one of the things that we bring it back into the risk space really is that, uh, you know, to be fair, anything that you can describe these days is a risk, whether it's operational, investment, uh, you know. So, one of the things that we've seen is that risk, therefore, has become very large, a very critical part and parcel of what people are looking at now. So you need data, you need new technologies to be able to harness uh, you know, these, these capabilities for our clients. And so that's really where um, I'm looking at and what my interest is uh, in terms of the uh, investments and the analytics around those. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so Madhu, you, you're... Um the, the usual in charge of the, the, the operating the Asia Pacific um, operation, right? Sure. Is it so? But your company is um, I, I, I found the news update about this is from the BMP Paris was a news release or something about uh, your company uh, recently the launched the fintech accelerator policy partnership with Prague and Play or something like that. So you guys are also doing the same thing or similar thing 
over here in Singapore or something like that? Yeah, so, it, and, it's, and it's an important uh, point because for us, we don't see uh, you know, innovation, we don't see FinTech as localized in headquarters. We see, in fact, Singapore as uh, one of the key parts of the strategy around innovation, around FinTech. Uh, we've definitely seen uh, the growth and the support that Singapore has provided uh, in terms of innovation uh, and, and setting up innovation labs, uh, access to capital, uh, connecting various parts of uh, the value chain together. Um, so that's really a, a core focus for us. And I think Singapore for us, therefore, really will drive a lot of this change, a lot of this dynamism in the marketplace. Um, you know, in terms of uh, people dedicated to it, I mean, we go through, uh, you know, hackathons, we have uh, launches around uh, task forces. And, uh, for us, really, the focus really is, how do you make this practical? How do you make this uh, relevant, live, and uh, implementable for our clients? That's really the key focus for so us. It has to be with a purpose. Investing in startups is also one of the options in terms of uh, collaborating or working with the uh, um, startups for you guys, uh, for uh, your company actually? It can be, absolutely. So, uh, in, in, uh, interestingly enough, in one of the uh, investment solutions that we've pioneered, uh, we've actually spent uh, you know, a great deal of collaboration with a startup, mm. uh, which was really focused around providing some very intelligent analysis, intelligent risk management solutions uh, for our clients. So things like uh, you know, natural language, predictive uh, learning around data, uh, and also being able to be a bit smarter around regulation. Mm. So rather than being reactive to regulatory changes, uh, you know, the platforms that enable us to be very proactive, mm. uh, provide consultative support to our clients, not advice, support. Uh, and that's really been, uh, I think, a, a very strong focus for us in terms of FinTech data enabling mm. our services and our value proposition. Can you uh, let some example of startups you are uh, currently collaborating with or working with? Uh, in terms of the, uh, how they say, the, uh, the context of open innovation within the uh, enterprise and uh, startups. Do you have any specific example? Um, well, don't want to name names right now, but I would say in terms of the key things we look at. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, we're a very large bank. We deal with data all the time. Um, and we have access to databases and, and you know, trillions and trillions of lines of data. Mm -hmm. So one of the key aspects for us is uh, more efficient, efficient and effective way of managing the data is, is very, sounds boring, but you know what, the more you can manage it, the more you can get information out of this, mm. so we probably agree. Um, one of the other things that we also see from, uh, you know, when we work with startups is uh, their ability to bring something else into the picture. Mm -hmm. And so one of the examples we've done in the past year is utilize a technology from, you know, the defense industry in terms of enhancing our product uh, management decisions. Mm -hmm. So for example, we connect uh, online globally in terms of operations, products managers, uh, you know, our regulators, our legal advisors, compliance, uh, in terms of being able to offer products and uh, design a product uh, more efficiently, more holistically. And if you take about the old days, you know, it was lots of paper, it was lots of conference calls and so forth. Uh, here, we're adopting something which is uh, more agile, uh, it's a lot more immediate, and it's also uh, the ability to sort of, uh, what we almost call it, uh, you know, crowds found, fund a lot of expertise within the bank to make those connections. Uh, we're a very large bank, and half the time we find that large organizations is, uh, you know, you don't know what people know from the bank, the unknown, unknowns and so forth. So that's the thing where uh, we've also seen technology help us in connecting the dots, breaking down the silos, uh, and add a lot more value, and, and also speed to market, which has been great. Great, thank you. Uh, so next, uh, let me ask um, Stuart. So, um, yeah, um, well, I heard the name of your company for the first time was probably almost like 10 years ago. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I, w I used to work with uh, ATD Data, which is one of the largest uh, credit card pay uh, payment processing company or something like that. So, in my understanding, the World Pay um, used to be a part of RBS, and then, um, which is very, um, how they say, it's probably one of the largest uh, credit, part, credit card payment processing network. Uh, they're connecting the uh, very different type of the uh, networks around the world, maybe, right? So, but um, you're trying to create something new. You're uh, through the uh, working with the startups or fintech industry kind of thing. So, what, what kind of thing do you want to create from now on? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, in 
the Asia Pacific market. I mean, World Pay is an English business, but I sort of re reverse a little bit. Um, and so in the UK business um, in London, that sort of uh, perhaps gives us some other opportunities around that sort of startup space. I mean, uh, I think uh, on the ground, you know, we, we have something like 60% sort of 60% of the, the payments market in that, in that particular country. Um, you know, like any sort of growing uh, company, you know, Asia Pacific is not necessarily the sort of same sort of statistics. Um, so, you know, what we see in the e-commerce space, but uh, we were talking about it before, um, you know, e-commerce in Asia Pacific is massive and you know, it's, a, it's driven by a number of things, you know, sort of mobility, uh, technology, really, really taking a leapfrog, I think, um, over and above, you know, what we sort of see in the, in the US and um, Europe and the UK. Uh, and so for us, investing you know, some time in startups in the Asia Pacific marketplace is really around um, you know, giving, uh, perhaps for somewhat similar to, to, to yourself, around you know, the expertise, um, the resource, uh, the experience, and, and that sort of mentorship that we can provide uh, you know, to sort of the companies in this space. Because quite frankly, you know, the next, um, and we were you know, part way here with the uh, NUS, for example, you know, these are the guys that could be the next entrepreneurs of tomorrow. These are the next big thing. So, you know, one would hope, perhaps, you know, from a marketing perspective, at least, you know, we're front of mind, uh, and we've helped some of these uh, these people and these companies, you know, get to a scale where then they become something that WorldPay can effectively support them, you know, moving moving forward. You know, we'd, we'd love to get the next uh, Alibaba before it gets to the sort of size it is right now. You want to do processing for them or just buy them out? Uh, well, we, we, Te technically, we already do, so that you can put that into you know, the, into perspective. But uh, I think they'll probably buy us out before we. we buy so, do you, do you have any fear like the Alibaba or those kind of guys might be uh, dominating the market in the future, or kind of things from the monkey's perspective? What do you think? That's a that's a that's a really really good question. I mean, I, I you know I sort of see it from a retail perspective. Um, we see it from a, a, a fintech perspective, the investments that they're doing in, um, in every sort of single country. You know, I think global domination is almost definitely at the, the sort of top of the bill for, for them as a business. Um, you, you could start getting into the semantics of sort of business strategy as to whether um, you know, they become too big and too, too uh, sort of sizable from a global perspective. You know, there, there is always an opportunity, I think, for, for innovation. Um, at a, in, a, in a niche. I think the, the most critical thing that we see from a payments perspective and where WorldPay perhaps benefits is, you know, we have scale. Uh, you know, we have scale right across the world. We have licenses in different markets. You know, we're, we're licensed here in Singapore, for example. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of creates perhaps certain advantages. So, you know, what happens next? Innovation starts to kick in. It's the companies out here that are thinking about the next big thing and, um, and how to sort of, uh, how, how to get ahead. So, absolutely, you know, global domination, I think, is on the cards, but, you know, will that sort of prevent further innovation? I, I would question whether that would be the case, because I think there's always room. The way you have to look at it is, there is so much more opportunity. The, the pie is growing so fast, uh, the losers will be more interested in thinking of how to get 2% get of more of that pie. The smart people and the winners would be focusing on how do I grow the pie 10%. I just want to pick up on a couple of points there with Varun and Stuart. A couple of things that really ring true to us when we talk to our clients, and these are the, the big boys, the pensions, the sovereign funds, <coughs> where they are looking in terms of investments, and therefore I, I'm going to talk about data and risk that are associated with it, but it's interesting you talk about uh, you know, uh, breaking down the barriers between industries and businesses. This is a key point. Um, you know, how do you define a bank anymore? How do you define uh, an internet company anymore? Uh, is there such a thing? And so what's interesting now is when we look at our clients, they want to essentially, uh, you know, exploit innovation themes as an investment opportunity. So no longer just looking at, you know, materials, industrials, energy, banks. They're now looking at saying, can we exploit these thematics? Now, that sounds fantastic. How the heck are you going to get the data to measure it, monitor it, Assess the risks. You would have the 10 year drilling data and the variables, the there numbers. And nothing is publicly disclosed, private information so hidden behind the layers of term sheets, behind three layers of investors. And you're, also, and you're also talking about companies that have changed their very nature of what they are. So they used to start off at something, they've changed to something else, now they've changed to something else. Uh, I don't know, is it the same company anymore? And the corporate filing still says technology company. Right, and this is the issue. 
and this is the issue. So, you know, what, what are we going to find? Are we going to find uh, endless portfolios with 90% allocation technology? Does that make any sense? You know, is that even where the risk is? Uh, so these are the kind of things that we are literally uh, now looking from a, a deep dive perspective in terms of data, in terms of uh, disparate extra financial data to solve some of these problems and to answer some of these questions. Uh, what we're also finding is as we go down this path, new questions come up. Come up. And so you end up with, I think, a very rich area of analysis, a very rich area mm. uh, to, to, to really work through. Mm. Um, so I sort of see disruption, I see the innovation as uh, you know, excellent, to mm. be fair. I mean, you, you can't avoid it and you have to, be, you have to embrace it. Uh, but it does come with a degree of trepidation, it does come with a degree of, you know, this is really what it is. Um, and then having those conversations with our clients, you know, they're not, you know, three month, six month investors. They have 20 year investment horizons. And so they make an investment, they're putting in, you know, billions. So this is the key piece in terms of, you know, how do you, uh, you know, make sense of it, how do you be granular and also intuitive and all repeated as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to repeat the success. I see, I see. Yeah. Thank you. One of the key aspects of that is in all that hype, when everyone wants to join the party, and everyone wants to know, okay, what is that ultimate destination? The fact we need to see is anyone who's saying that this is what the industry will look like in five years is actually just making up stuff. At this moment, no one knows where the industry will be in five years. There will be progress, there will be new technologies, there will be new solutions, there will be new scenarios. And every month, every week, they will move and it will be a very evolutionary stage. The winners will be the people who will accept the mindset that it is going to change very significantly at a very rapid pace. And anyone trying to take a short side, okay, this is how it's going to look like in three years, is, is quite complicated. Mm. Max, if you're lucky, you can know the right direction and right theme. Anyone who's claiming anything more than that is just uh, playing a luck, lucky lot. I mean, you will have a better odds in a casino than that. We're very close. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd actually just want to add one thing to add. Uh, I mean, you, you sort of mentioned the timeline of three years. I mean, I, I worked in the, in the telecoms industry, um, and I remember sort of voice over IP coming in, and was slightly digressing perhaps from fintech, but uh, um, you know, the doomsayers were there, right? The, the telecom industry is over. Um, but actually, you know, we, yes, we sort of see it all around us now, but we're still using a mobile phone that's still using the old sort of copper lines to go and sort of uh, wrap those sort of telephone calls over the world. So I think the point is, is that you know, even technology can change over three, five, but actually it could be even 10, 15. It, it still takes time for culture and, uh, and sort of that technology change, I think, to, uh, to, to really sort of you know, come true. So one thing I wanted to pick up on there was, I think this is a really key point in terms of long-term sustainability. So one of the things that we've been doing a lot of research into is sustainable business models. And you start defining that various ways. You know, the classic thing is, you know, is this thing set up to work for the next five years? Well, actually, why not the next 10, 15, 20? And it's not really about saying that, you know, I've got uh, widget A, widget B. It's actually about adaptability. It's really about cultural change. It's really about the management having the vision, if you will, to be able to execute strategy. But that strategy is dynamic, you know, and communication of a strategy. So we've been doing a lot of research into this piece because, uh, you know, you have to step outside of the classic sort of, you know, what are the, what are the metrics, what are the valuation principles? Uh, and then you start actually talking to the actual management team and you realize that there are these leaders and they're the laggards. They're the ones that will, you know, be there and as you rightly point out, you know, they'll blame the 90% and they'll be the ones that will be sitting there saying, oh, I've got the 10% but I'm, gonna, I'm the biggest fish in this pond, mm -hmm. right? And that's not really not what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Well, um, I forgot to take a quick survey in the beginning of the session, actually. But I'm just wondering how many of our audience are coming from the Singapore and coming out of, of the Singapore kind of thing. So would you like to raise your hand if you are based in Singapore? Thank you very much. So would you like to raise your hand if you come over from outside Singapore? Nobody? Oh, very few. Thank you very much. So, you know, Singapore is a very uh, developed country. Uh, I actually came from Tokyo, but Tokyo is also probably the, uh, one of the most developed country and then a city actually. But, so the, the financial institutions or banks or those kind of things are very mature and then we can find any kind of the machine or um, 
Yeah, every single communist store in Chang has a kind of tutorial machine inside of the shop, actually. So, which is very common for uh, withdrawing or um, kind of sending, tra uh, transferring the money or kind of things. But this, this, this is very supernatural in Japan or in Singapore, but it's totally different in the emerging country, maybe, right? So, if you um, talk about the fintech or kind of things, actually, so which Kind of, what kind of the, uh, the market you are mentioning usually? So, yeah, go ahead. It depends on how you classify. Having those machines or no machines is not fintech or not fintech. It's a question of what problems are you solving and is that, is that what makes sense? Is that what is culturally relevant? Is that what's commercially relevant? So having a machine or having a mobile app doesn't make anyone developed or underdeveloped. Uh, some of the oldest mobile wallets are in the least developed countries and some of the most developed countries have some of the highest check circulation in the market today and some of the super developed countries are struggling with a, so they're not worried about cashless they're worried about coinless so which is why it's a lot of clickbait media friendly way of putting one country or one city over other saying this is more developed this is less developed each of them have very different challenges each of them have very different uh, objectives and each of them wants to achieve very different things. For a country with uh, less than 30% population having bank account versus a country with 90% bank account, they are very too different. Some of them are just trying to figure out that people can get services more easily. That's it. They are not worried about what technology is there at the back. While someone else is trying to get 1% extra productivity and that's innovation. So as an industry, what we need to do first is get out of that rut of trying to do the stack of rankings and comparing things which are not even alike to each other. Mm. So which is why I personally would not have an opinion on trying to set someone on each other. Yes, every country is doing something. Some of it is going right. Some of it can improve, but we can't stack them up. What I am pretty impressed actually um, in, uh, in Singapore, and, and I absolutely agree with you on the ranking thing, so it's quite wise, but um, you know, one of the biggest things I sort of see as I sort of you know, traverse across the region is the impact of government and, and regulation. Um, I'm sure this is going to come up at some point anyway in the sort of conversation, but um, the, uh, the, the, what the government has done in Singapore, the MAS for example, and that they've tried to sort of drive investment, they've tried to drive thought leadership. You know, they're putting some very interesting people into into the sort of upper echelons of the organisation. You know, Manti, for example, he's ex Citibank. You know, there's some very very sort of strong thinking, I think, and, and I have to admire, I think, the Singapore government in terms of you know the direction at which they want to want to take it because that's that's not happening ev everywhere else. And I think if it starts at the top, um, and uh, there's that sort of uh, that thinking and that leadership, I mean, that's that makes a massive difference. Globally, the biggest innovations came when the government was behind them. Uh, internet came out of a project at DARPA. GPS came out of a project at DOD. So if you look at some of the biggest innovations we are looking at here, they came because there was institutional and structural support to advance them. And again, regionally there are a lot and which is why again, for a small country to do some of those things is slightly easier than a very large country. But even if you look at India, for example, they went in and digitized identities for a billion people. Government paid for it. There was no private corporation which paid paid up money up front to digitize the identity of a billion people. So government has a huge role and it would be best if liberals would accept it more uh, humbly rather than complaining about it. I think, I think you're absolutely right. <coughs> you need a policy. You need that government support. Uh, you, but to be fair, you need it all throughout the value chain. I think if you have one aspect of the value chain that doesn't believe in it and that doesn't support it, uh, you're not necessarily going to build a technologically savvy or a, you know, a sustainable business model. It just doesn't work. Uh, you know, it's a bit like, you know, I want to cook a dish. You know, I'll have all the ingredients, but sorry, you know, I don't have a stove, but I'm still going to be convinced I'm going to cook this dish. You need all the ingredients, but you also need the infrastructure, you need the ability to be able to deliver the goods at the end of the day. Now, here's the interesting piece, is that what we're excited about in the fintech space is that, you know, where does it go in terms of breaking down some of the old models? That's really what we're excited about as well. So we talk about India as a great example. Now, to be very blunt, you know, 
you know, is there any sense in you know us uh, you know turning up to every uh, village or every town in India and setting forth the BNP Paribas you know, signage and bricks and mortar? To be fair, it's a perception, it's a comfort thing. Right? People will go, oh, it's a bank, I can say it's very stable. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, you have people who are probably the first thing uh, you know they get out of bed is they've probably got their mobile phones, they've got their apps, they've got the, they can do their banking. Um, so it's quite a big dichotomy you know, that you're dealing with. Um, so in some sense, you'd really want to be able to, uh, you know, modify your business models and also acknowledge the fact that in some countries you can't apply what you do in Europe or what you can't do in, in the U.S. And you have to be adaptable and you also have to be dynamic. And this is, again, going back to my point around sustainability, is how do you ensure this is something that is permanent? So the dynamism is there, it's permanent. And that, again, requires support from the government, requires support from industry associations, uh, you know, the value chain. And, and, there, and there, just to sort of the flip side of that, you know, you look at somewhere like Australia, you know, where they talk about investment, you know, the government talks about investment in, into the sort of startup community. And, and I, mean, I know, from, I mean, I lived there for sort of seven years, and I, I you know, through the, the contacts I have down there, the, the people are sort of definitely feeling very different. And I think what the, what the government is saying, what's actually happening is very different. So, and they, and they feel that that is stifling the growth, um, you know, in the Australian market. A lot of companies are actually then ultimately going overseas, perhaps to the west coast of the US, to go and get investment and sort of resource and ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you know, again, government plays a massive role. I think that's the sort of the ultimate point. And, and if, again, if the value chain isn't sort of all part of that and, and connected, then it creates a problem. I'll say just quickly on that. I would say it, it, gen it then changes the trajectory of the country itself. Because you know you, the country, different countries go through different stages of growth, enhancement, development, uh, capital, foreign flows, and so forth, uh, and that's really quite an important point. So I'm Australian, like it or not. Uh, one of the things that we've seen from Australia is uh, we've gone from a very producer commodity-based economy, and you know we've lost manufacturing jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm speaking personally, not as a BNP at this point. One of the things that is important to, to, to highlight is that it's a vast country. It's huge. If you laid, if you overlaid the Australia on a map of the US, you would pretty much see the same size. And so, you know, you need smart strategies, you need coordination, you need government support, policy, and the value chain. I think you need everyone on, on the same bandwagon. The other aspect of it is understanding the difference between services and utilities. If you believe financial services are core, then they become utility. If you believe identity is a right or a, is a right or a privilege, for access to financial services is a right or a privilege. The moment they go towards becoming utility, that's when the role of the state would come in. Just like water, for example, water is accepted as utility. So the government ensures that everyone will get access to water at a predefined price. And there would not be a party A deciding how much it's going to cost. Electricity now is treated. Internet, the telcos are still figuring out this net neutrality and all. So which is where when you enter into that era, that your core business is becoming a utility from a service. Telcos are still coming to terms with that reality. Our industry needs to go there. We will reach that point where it would go to the point that when it becomes a right instead of a privilege. And that would change the reality. Now, this, this is a great point. So again, going back to what I said earlier about investment opportunities, this is, this is the transformation. This is exactly it. Because you're changing the very fabric of what the industry is, what businesses they're involved in, what they're not involved in anymore. So I think these are the kind of things that are posing more and more challenges for our large clients. And that's really where, you know, bringing it back to the FinTech topic, for me, that's enormously important. We need to be able to find and, and move and, and not just go along with the changes, but somehow even preempt, predict, you know, guide, if you will. Uh, that's, a, that's a massive challenge. Can we, can we keep FinTech though exciting for a little bit longer though? Because uh, Telco is really, really sort of quite dull now. The, and the opportunities are very limited. At least there's opportunities now in FinTech. See, uh, from the Telcos, the challenge was that they became the back end provider. And right now, you don't care what's the SIM card because 80% of your activities are dependent on network access, not on your telco's brand name. And which is where it becomes utility. It is edging towards becoming a utility. 
when you get water in your house or electricity in your house, you do not care which power plant produced it, which company turbines were used to make it, which country made, which oh, company made the apart from new water, correct? <laughs> you don't even know whether it's new or <laughs> whether it's old unless you know where where your pipeline is coming. But but the idea is telco industry moved at that point. And when the financial services move at that point, so if you look at China, that's where it's already happened. What do you do is you invest in there, there's a marketplace, and most likely it's most of, a lot of them are white label products. You don't even know who's the provider back. When you take an Uber or a Grab cab, as a customer, you get this happen, you don't know what's happening underneath it. So once the industry reaches towards there, at that time, the industry needs to bring out value propositions mm. if they do not want to become boring. Because if they, if it becomes that whosoever else the customer interface and everyone else is commoditized back in, it becomes boring. Mm. Mm. So it's a question of can you keep it exciting by creating new use cases, new value, new opportunities, else you become uh, a boring SMS which you only mm. use for bank OTP now. Yes, that's the long term, long term business model, long term sustainability. Correct. So um, we have the four minutes remaining for this session. So this is a great opportunity to take some questions from our audience. So if you have any questions to this awesome panel, please raise your hand. No? No, very shy. <laughs> this is a typical Singaporean compliment, is it? <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, OK. Everyone right. is not, they haven't got out of the sleep post lunch. <laughs> you didn't get them in the <laughs> So, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. So. Hi, so thanks for sharing. I think the panel made really interesting comments about how innovation starts from the top and that government support, structural support is very important for innovation. Um, so, I think sorry. the panel made really interesting points about um, how innovation starts from the top and how structural support from the government is really important for that. So in particular, I was really interested in India, your comment on India. I mean, in India is one of the biggest economies in the world and it's comparable to China. So with regards to India, what unique challenges do you think they will face in developing fintech? From India's perspective? Yes, from a political perspective as well. Uh, so India is a federal structure with uh, infinite political parties because Indian constitution allows anyone to start a political party. So you have... Uh, a system in which if you win 35-36% of all the votes, you are you you have a landslide victory. Thir at 33 or 32% because everything else is split. So technically, you will have 65% country or electorate against you, but you will be the decision maker. And when you have that at a uh, municipal level, a, a provincial level and at national level. So you have three stacks of system in which the minority, as long as it's consolidated, can be the decision maker. Having decisions and then following through them. For example, the current government used to oppose the Aadhaar scheme when they were in the opposition, but when they come to the power, they support the same thing. And now the guys who are in the opposition who were government before say, why are you supporting this? You were opposing it. But they say, yeah, you were the one started. So now everyone wants to, is confused. Do they support it? If, because everyone has opposed and supported the same thing at some point of the time. So when you have such kind of structure where uh, there are too many open ends and people have all the incentives to move the positions, for an industry to find a direction where they can build those long-term roadmaps, because you don't know when the policy is going to change. I'll give you two examples of policy which changed. Uh, Indian government announced every telco must KYC all their users within next 12 months. You know how much that means? You're talking about 350 million users need to be KYC again, else their SIM card connections will be cut. They will lose a telco connectivity. They also announced that all wallets, and we're to, again, the, it's private numbers, so wallet companies announced, no one knows if they have it or not. We're talking about 400 million plus wallets which need to do all their KYC again by 30th of June of this year, else no new credit is provided. So anyone who built a business according to that had not factored the cost of that in. Again, is it right or wrong? Yes, it's right to have that KYC. And, but 
Is it right to have it at the starting? What is the right frame? Should you give two months? Should you give nine months? Who should pay for it? So when you have all those moving pieces, those are the kind of challenges. And an industry is very adaptive. As long as they know what direction it is, there are changes. There is adaptability, agility required. But as long as you know this is the direction it's going to go in, then the rest of it can be figured out. So I hope that addresses your India question. Just, and maybe just add a, a couple of things. I mean, I'm sure everybody's sort of heard the, the recent sort of removal of, uh, of notes you know, within the Indian, uh, um, um, in, in India. And I think uh, in relation to your question around um, innovation, I find that sort of quite interesting because uh, you know, I, I do a bit of work in India and I, I find it one of the most innovative you know, countries in, in the region because uh, perhaps from a cultural perspective, there's sort of so much upside um, opportunity. Um, and in that sort of situation with the, with the cash removal, you know, you had companies like Ola, for example, then offering, um, you know, delayed settlement, for example, delayed payment, you know, for their services, so that because people didn't perhaps have the notes, for example, it gave them something different. So it was a different business model that started to um, occur. So they were trying to create opportunity out of, out of a particular challenge that was put in place. Um, I think the, the, the other challenge I think that we sort of see from a payments company with India is that, is the, and we saw that in telecoms as well, was the sort of the, the control of the border almost. And, and again, back to the point earlier on around regulation and government, the government really has to be in line to, to really sort of help um, you know, drive that sort of innovation. I think um, I, I was on a panel with a guy from uh, Freshdesk, which is a sort of SaaS business in India, quite, quite well-known business. And, I, and he sort of said, um, you know, the question was, is there any sort of last bits of advice um, for the, the audience? And he said, uh, well, if I can give you one good bit of advice, incorporate your business outside of India. And I think that's a, that's a big chain, a shame when it comes down to innovation. Thank you very much. So we are running out of the time, running out of the time so that concludes our session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. So please uh, give a round of applause to the awesome Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.